My invisible friends, hello and welcome back to our series. In this, the most amateurish of the videos I've included in our series. About these immortals whose flux is not created by currents in a coil, but rather by a permanent magnet. An introduction. Equivalent electromotive force of a magnetomotive force. How is that? When we have a coil with a current in it, applying magnetomotive force to magnetic circuit, N times I. We can represent that in an equivalent electric circuit by an electromotive force with this value, Ni, an ideal V source. What about a magnet? Well, a magnet in its equivalent electric circuit behaves as a current source a current source that delivers flux, so it is a flux source. But not an ideal one, no. A non-ideal current source, that is the electric circuit equivalent of a permanent magnet. Let's have a look as a refresher of how it is that we analyze a circuit with a, an ideal current source. This current source with the value I s connected to a resistor with a resistance R x ohms. Graphically, if we have the current versus the voltage in either of those elements, we see that for the current source, the representation is a horizontal line at the value I s, the value of the current source. Of course, the reason is the current in that source is the same I s for any value of the voltage in the circuit. But the relationship between Vx, the voltage in the resistor, and Ix, or Is, I, the current in the circuit, is given by Ohm's law. Graphically, that relationship is given by this red slanted line that has a slope 1 over Rx. The intersection of both characteristics gives us what is the actual voltage in the resistor. But I've said that our permanent magnet does not behave as an ideal current source, but as a real nonlinear current source. So let's analyze a circuit, an electric circuit, with a current source that has not the ideal characteristic, but rather it is far from ideal IV characteristic. That is a current source. And uh, as before, the voltage Vx in the resistor and its currents are related to one another by Ohm's law. Graphically, given by the red line, that has again the slope 1 over Rx. The intersection of the current source, nonlinear characteristic, and the linear characteristic of the resistor gives us what is the actual voltage in the resistor and what is the current in the circuit. Now let's create a flux instead of a current, eh? Creating a flux with a current is something that we've learned how to do. We apply a current to a coil in the magnetic circuit, and that current in that coil will apply an MMF that will be responsible for establishing a flux in the circuit. The magnetic coil will take the flux over to the air gap on the right, which is where we need it. We have learned that under certain conditions we can represent that magnetic circuit with this equivalent electric circuit. Instead of the coil, we have a voltage source, an ideal one, with a value Ni, the same value of the MMF applied by the coil. And in the circuit, we've represented the magnetic core by its reluctance RFE and the air gap by its reluctance R sub naught. Well, you know what is the catch here, that that electric circuit is valid only if the permeability of the magnetic core is constant or, which is more likely to happen, if the reluctance of the air gap R0 is far greater than the reluctance of the magnetic core. In that case, we neglect the iron's reluctance and have that circuit, which say the MMF applied by the coil is applied directly to the air gap. When we solve the circuit, what we get is not the current. What we get is the flux in the original magnetic circuit. 
But now let's take our attention to the subject of permanent magnets. Let's begin with that MMF applied not to the air gap, but to a piece of iron with a very wide hysteresis loop, what we have nicknamed hard iron. A hard iron, a piece of iron with a wide hysteresis loop is perfect for fabricating a permanent magnet. When we apply an excitation, wait a minute, that graphic is B versus H, but we know that B is proportional to the flux in the circuit and that H is proportional to the current in the coil and to the total MMF applied by the coil. Well, when we increase that MMF starting here at zero, the flux, of course, will increase until we reach saturation. But when we reduce the MMF, we reduce the current in the coil, the flux, of course, decreases, but at the point in which the current in the coil is zero, the flux in the circuit is not zero anymore. The piece of iron on the right has become permanently magnetized. It is a permanent magnet. That point there is known as the remnant flux. And if we wanted to demagnetize that piece of iron, we would have to apply a negative MMF with the current in the coil all the way down to this point, the coercive force. At this point, the flux in the circuit is zero. The piece of iron on the right has been demagnetized. On the right, magnetomotive force applied to the magnet. On the left, the one who's applied the MMF actually is the magnet itself. This is the area that will be of interest to us when we analyze the behavior of the magnet. How do we create a flux with a permanent magnet? Well, look at it. The magnet has replaced the coil with a current, and now we have the air gap. We've said, represent uh, that magnet with an equivalent current source. Current source who? What? Which one? Well, observe again in this characteristic of flux versus MMF. Uh, but when we analyze uh, that circuit, and now we care what happens between the remnant flux and the coercive force. We don't care about MMF applied to the magnet, but rather about MMF applied by the magnet. This is the region of operation of the circuit right there. So let me flip that curve horizontally like so. This is the area where we're going to be working. This is MMF applied by the magnet here. Well, in uh, that circuit, the MMF of the air gap, the one applied the drop, if you will, the magnetic potential drop MMF not in the air gap, is reluctance of the air gap multiplied by the flux in the air gap. Uh, but um, that is just a line on this uh, flux versus MMF graphic, right? Uh, that is the line of the air gap at the intersection with the characteristic of the permanent magnet will give us the point of operation of that magnetic circuit, which gives us what is the flux in the air gap on this side, on this axis, and down here, what is the MMF applied by the permanent magnet to the air gap. Please observe one thing. If the air gap is too big, the reluctance will be, will be much higher and then the slope of this line, 1 over reluctance, will be even lower. And then the point of operation is down here, and the MMF applied by the permanent magnet, it gets dangerously close to the coercive force. At that point, you run the risk of demagnetizing the permanent magnet. That is one reason why permanent magnets are stored short-circuited like so. They are stored at the remnant flux point. Now, how do we create the flux in a DC motor? Normally, in our classes, we've done that with coils and currents this way. We have these 2,000 turn coils being split into halves, 1,000 turns on the top, 
and a thousand turns at the bottom and a current of two amps is flowing through them, creating a magnetic flux in the air gap. Mm-hmm. But let's replace all those coils by a permanent magnet. Remove the coils like so on the figure on the right and then in the middle of the magnetic circuit we include our permanent magnet. That magnet will create the flux in the air gap. The rest of the machine's behavior is as seen in class. Now, thanks to www.electrical4u.com, we have a very nice picture and video of a permanent magnet DC motor. This one, by the way, has not one magnet, but two. One on the left and one on the right. Between those two permanent magnets, of course, the north pole of the one on the right on the right faces to the shaft and the south pole on the magnet on the left faces the shaft we have the coils of the rotor here is a cross section of that uh, uh, motor and in it I have included apart from the magnets and the rotor I have included also what is the core the core that closes the magnetic flux path Observe that each one of those magnets has a north pole and a south pole. So that the rotor sees a north pole on one side and a south pole permanently on the other side. Let's have a look at this one in motion. Look. Notice one thing. The only two points of connections, the only two cables we will get out of this uh, permanent magnet DC motor are the ones connected to those two brushes, the two terminals of the armature, of the coils rotating in that rotor of that machine. The terminal A1, armature connector 1, and armature connector 2. Those are the ones you would find available if you have a permanent magnet DC motor. And that is all my invisible friends. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again in our next movie. And cut.